Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the In-Person Commonwealth Club. Hello, Catherine. Hello, Ginny. <laughs> Um, good evening and welcome everyone to this evening's program at the Commonwealth Club. My name is Janine Zakaria and I am the Carlos Kelly McClatchy Lecturer in the Department of Communication at Stanford University, where I teach news reporting, writing fundamentals, and foreign correspondence. Prior to coming to Stanford, I was a longtime journalist who reported around the world uh, for the Washington Post, Bloomberg News, Reuters, and others. So I'm delighted to be the moderator for tonight's program, which as you know, focuses on Catherine Corcoran's terrific new book, in the Mouth of the Wolf, a murder, a cover-up, and the true cost of silencing the press. Since Adam already went over the format, I'm going to skip over that part of my prepared intro, um, but please be thinking about questions that we can integrate as we get through the conversation. So it's my pleasure to introduce Catherine. Catherine is the former Associated Press Bureau Chief for Mexico and Central America, and as Bureau Chief, she led an award-winning team that broke major stories about drug cartels in Mexico, state violence, and abuse of authority. Until last semester, she was the co-director of the Cronkite Noticias, the bilingual reporting program at Arizona State University's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Her new book, In the Mouth of the Wolf, chronicles the brutal 2012 murder of Regina Martinez, a prominent journalist who used to report on political corruption and abuse in Mexico. Catherine reveals what she learned during her investigation to uncover the truth behind Regina's death and recount some of her own harrowing experiences, um, which we'll get into in the conversation today. So Catherine, welcome to the, the Commonwealth Club. Um, before we get into it, I just wanted to frame it a little bit for the audience, for people who don't spend all day, every day, thinking about these issues like you and I do. Okay. That perhaps not obvious to everybody or wouldn't be intuitive that Mexico is in fact the most dangerous country to be a reporter outside of a war zone. And as you write, Mexico, country not at war, had a democratically elected government, and that was arguably the most strategic partner to the United States, was one of the most dangerous countries on earth for journalists and even tied Afghanistan one year for, for the number of journalists killed. In the first eight months of this year, there have been 13 journalists killed. There were 13 journalists killed, um, according to the Committee to Protect Journalists. And you've written this book that focuses on just one of those murders that happened on April 28th, 2012, Regina Martinez, a star investigative reporter for a publication called Proceso, which we'll talk about. Um, and we'll talk about why you wrote this book. And there's of course been a lot of um, discussion recently about threats to journalists, um, some prominent uh, internationally known journalists who were killed like, um, one journalist who I knew, Jamal Khashoggi, a Saudi journalist who you may have n know the story of. But what I found interesting reading your book, among other things, is that through this single character narrative of Regina, a reporter that most of us, most Americans may not have heard of, we see up close in a chilling way what's at stake, right? Mexico, a democracy, a young democracy, but when you don't have the freedom of the press, when you have the demonization of the press, the threats of the press, what can happen to your society? And so unfortunately, as we know, and we'll talk about this, I hope, Catherine, that these kinds of stories are no longer foreign, right? And we had, of course, in 2018, a mass shooting at a, the Annapolis Capital Gazette that left five journalists dead, as you may recall. And just this past September, a local elected official was charged in the stabbing death of a veteran Las Vegas Review Journal staff writer, Jeff German, because he didn't like his coverage. So I'll, we'll talk, and I think we need to talk, and one of the things I think a lot about at Stanford, and I'm so excited to discuss this with you, is the impact that having a president who, a former president, who called the, the press the enemy of the people um, hundreds of times, um, and uh, fake news, the impact that had not only on the press here in the United States, but abroad, where the United States is supposed to be the protector of a free press everywhere to stand up for that. I covered the State Department for a long time, so I would like cover the freedom of press reports. So let's talk about, um, first of all, I salute you for your bravery in writing this book. 
Thank you. This is a very tough book to, to write, to read. Um, and all of the Mexican journalists that you celebrate and honor with your reporting here. Let's talk about the opening of the book. Let's just get right into it, where you have this cinematic fashion. You have a th your, it's your first day as the bureau chief in Mexico City, and there's a threat. Right. Let's just go right into it. Tell, tell us about that first day on the job there. Well, I w as I say I, in the book, I was, I was woken up at 6 a.m. by a telephone call, and I was getting ready. Literally, I was going into my first day on the job, and so I was just getting up then anyway to start you know, going in for my first day and just thinking, I had sort of done the job as, as sort of an acting bureau chief and, and I was thinking, oh, but the, you know, this is it and getting ready for a normal day. And then I get this phone call that says that the AP received a f threat from, the drug cartel, from a drug cartel, from the Zetas, if you know any of the drug cartels, and, um, and that it came via text message to one of our journalists and that the the message said we had to write a story saying the then president was uh, um, in collusion with El Chapo, who's now in jail and l serving a life sentence in New York, but he was the, the biggest drug, um, drug lord at the time, and, um, and that we had to write that this corruption was going on, that the president was actually in collusion with this world-renowned fugitive drug lord, El Chapo Guzman. And or or we were going to get a special visit, and the uh, the the threat listed a lot of very specific information that was concerning, including the address of the AP bureau, and the AP bureau in Mexico City is a regional bureau, so it's very big. It has HR, it has all the it has um, all the IT people. It's like about sixty people, and so it wasn't just a journalist or the the journalist it was the whole office because they knew who we were and so that just set into motion um on my very first day um some i mean i got to see how a big agency handles something like that and but i knew because when you're the bureau chief they depend on you to obviously to be the advisor you know the most you're on the ground and I knew, even though it was my first day, that we had to take it very seriously because these journalist killings had already started and had been going on for sev several years. And it almost felt like, well, it was eventually going to reach us sometime. And so, um, so it was interesting. That I had already spent two and a half years in, in Mexico as a journalist. And so I just knew instinctively what to do because I'd seen it so much in other, you know, these smaller media organizations. And so I said, you know, We've got to take this seriously. It's not a, you know, it's not a hoax. We can't pretend it's a hoax or see what happens next. It's like we have to act now. And so they did. They did a lot of things to, um, to shore up the uh, security. And the person who actually received the threat was ta he and his family were taken out of the country. And um, so it was. Um, and then as I, and then a, a, a local journalist was killed that same week. And so from the very first day of my job there that's what I dealt with and I dealt with it almost every day f for five years and so I often say um, uh, you know I didn't find the story the story found me and I just felt like at, you know I, I had to write about it. it it just was it was all consuming and so you had the backing of the AP the mightiest news organization I would argue on earth um, and it, there's a, a sense throughout that you felt as an international reporter that you were somewhat protected. Um, but that doesn't necessarily extend maybe to the stringers, or the people, the local journalists who are working for the AP. Maybe. I don't know. I wonder. Yes. And it, it, certainly, it, it certainly did not extend to five foot, hundred pound Regina Martinez, mm -hmm. who spent her career uh, going after and reporting about corrupt officials. Mm -hmm. Right. So talk about that dichotomy between, okay, I'm an international reporter, I'm protected versus these local reporters who are so too frequently killed. Well, this started around 2006, 2007, um, the, and, and there were six or seven or ten journalists killed a year. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was astonishing. 
you know, in a democracy and, and a country not at war. And, and it just went on like nothing was unusual about that. And what the government, and, and, and these journalists were all very local journalists. They worked for very small newspapers. They were covering local, their local governments or um, local corruption, crime. A lot of them were crime reporters. They were covering crime and they were covering the war between the two, the, the cartels throughout the country in various spots. And so, um, so they were considered very, they were very poorly paid crime reporters, kind of like tabloid reporters. That's how it started out. And so, so the government was very swift and very effective in telling us that they weren't real reporters, they were working for narcos because they covered crime and they said that they were being paid to like cover certain sides of the war and they got between the two sides and that's how they ended up dead and so they so the government would be very uh, deliberate about saying to us the international press these aren't real reporters they're not reporters like you're a reporter and I think in a way it was to keep us you know say this isn't going to happen to you but also so that we wouldn't cover it as journalists, this attempt to silence the press. And it was very effective because they never investigated the cases and there was no transparency. So we never, we had no way of knowing. There clearly were some cases of narco reporters that was and is a phenomenon, but there, the numbers were so high. It was hard to believe that all of them were that. And so um, the, the people there, they work, they're paid sometimes just by stories they'll get five bucks a story or five bucks a photograph or if they're on staff they make three hundred dollars a month they're very poorly paid and at the time in, in the last 10 years the, the media has changed quite a bit in mexico but at the time the their own media organizations wouldn't back them up if they got into something that was like a cor corruption investigation and something got them killed their own editors would distance themselves from the dead reporter and say, oh, well, we didn't assign that, or we didn't know what they were working on, or, you know, oh, well, they were just a, a stringer. And so they were out there in this incredibly dangerous situation completely on their own, which was a total contrast to what happened at the AP. As soon as we got a threat, there's a vice president for um, global mm -hmm. security and that guy was on a plane to Mexico City in about five minutes. And so, and, and, and there was an investigation done and we had, um, we had monitors outside seeing, you know, looking for strange activity and all that kind of stuff. And these people were out there completely on their own. But the impact on us was more that the terrain became so dangerous that we had to, we couldn't assume that wasn't going to happen to us. Mm -hmm. And so the, the manner in which we covered Mexico changed dramatically because up until that point, Mexico was a, a quiet country, and it was an easy... I don't know, did you ever report there? Really? Yeah, not like you. I mean, but I, I, mean, I was more of a parachute in that. The Middle East is more of my focus, but... But but when you parachuted in, it was probably pretty quiet and yeah, pretty easy. Fine. Yeah, I used to... When I worked for the Mercury News, I used to go there by myself mm -hmm. and didn't worry about anything. And so the, the change was overnight, and so we had to, at the AP, have security protocols. We couldn't... We no longer sent journalists out alone. They had to go in a team. We had GPS tracking. We had all this stuff that we didn't need in the past. And so it impacted us in that way, even though the president at the time was very adamant about, he, about nobody hitting the international press. And I remember one time one of our stringers, um, he was in an attack. He was with another guy in a car and they were shot at. And the other guy, um, his leg was injured. Our guy wasn't hurt at all, but I got woken up on a Saturday with that phone call from the president's office. The, the president telling us, before I even knew, because it happened late on a Friday night, and they were so concerned that someone had hit a journalist who was affiliated with the AP, mm. and they wanted to take care of that right away, and they wanted us to know that they were really on top of it. So that was the message for us. Meanwhile, these local journalists were just completely ignored, and, and it was like nothing was happening. And in the case of Regina Martinez, uh, what, what you note is interesting is that she wasn't one of these narco reporters. She avoided the, the drug topics. She really just went after the government corruption. And that this is, 
and we're not going to reveal what happens because you have to read the book in your investigation. But um, talk about why that was significant. So in the middle of this campaign to say these were just narco journalists, this very high profile woman with very high standards who's known for being very aggressive ends up dead. And I had actually spoken to her and tried to hire her to cover a story for us in Veracruz because at one time in the past she had been a stringer for the AP and now she was working for Proceso and, and uh, so I, I was just hoping against hope that she could help us out, throw us a hand and she couldn't because she was writing the story for Proceso. But we just had two brief phone conversations and the people inside the AP office said to me, because we were out of options for getting somebody out there, and they said to me, oh, she used to be one of our stringers. She's really good. And so she obviously met the AP standards. And I talked to her briefly, and she couldn't do it. And I didn't think another thing about it until I read on our own AP wire that she had been murdered. And it was just clear to everybody at that point that these were efforts to silence reporters who were uncovering uncomfortable things. And that's why her case got so much attention. And that's why I chose the case to write the book, because it was obvious to us for the first time without any investigation that that's what it was. And it was also a message. Reporters, national reporters in Mexico City, who also have some measure of protection, um, from the national reporters to the local reporters, everyone took it as a threat a threat against the entire press corps because she did work for a national magazine and they did have a measure of protection kind of like the the international reporters did and so um so the message to everyone was if they go if they went after her they can come after me and it just changed the whole um i guess the 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 sensibility of the press at the time because they hit her. It had a huge impact nationally. And so you give a couple of reasons why you wrote this book and pursued this story, why you decided to focus on it. And, well, I counted three that you wrote. One, you wanted people to care about what's happening in Mexico. And this is a, maybe a way to get into that. Two, you wanted to solve the whodunit, right? To, quote, shine a spotlight on those who had gotten away with murder. And then third, quote, I was watching the elements of what I saw in a weak emergency democracy, one plagued by violence and moral bankruptcy on the part of many leaders occur in my own country, which really brought it home. So talk about these motivations and how they changed as you were doing your reporting. Well, it did change because I thought there was absolutely nothing being done about these killings and they're getting worse. They're actually getting worse. This is the one of the, this is the record worst year so far. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I thought, you, you know, as a journalist, what we do is we just tell stories. We're not activists, we don't change things. But what we wanna do is give people the information they need to change something. And so I thought, at least as an international correspondent, I could bring this story to a wider audience, to people outside of, of Mexico. And initially it was a hard sell because you, you get this, you, if you go to- From a the pub publishers. Yeah, like from the, the publishers. You go to the publisher and they say, well, who cares about Mexico, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when I did st at first start to pitch it, I, I did have that issue and they said, um, I didn't have a 30,000 foot angle. And so then, w but then my initial 30,000 foot angle was, well, this is a democracy. And at the time, if you looked at all emerging democracies around the world, they were the most dangerous countries for journalists. They were killing a lot of journalists in Brazil and in Philippines and in India. They kill a lot of journalists in India, um, Pakistan. So I, I thought it was a worldwide phenomenon that, uh, that really warranted examination because it's so counterintuitive why why are they killing reporters in democracies and and there is a question to answer that question if you want me to go into it mm -hmm. um but then as i say in the book the most shocking angle of all was when i heard donald trump call the media the enemy of the people and uh corrupt because and liars 
because that's exactly the language they used in Mexico to get us to ignore these crimes. They're corrupt. They're not journalists. Uh, Mexico for many years was ruled by a, a authoritarian one par single party and um, they too, if the press started to get out of line because they, they were able to control the press for many decades with this one party system and when they started getting out of the line out of line, they too called the press the enemy of the people back in like the 40s and 50s, way before Donald Trump and so there was this all of a sudden this great parallel between the language and the narrative in this place, a, a democracy that was very dangerous for journalists, and then the same narrative here, and then what followed were attacks on the journal, uh, like physical attacks on journalists in a way that I never experienced in my many decades. I, I don't know about you, but I, the environment for being a journalist in the United States because of this rhetoric has changed dramatically. And it's nowhere near Mexico, and I wanna make that clear. But you would see at ver various events where the press would go to cover, they would become the target of the police or the military or the, or the, the, the whatever, rally goers. And in all my years as a, as a reporter, I never, felt in, I never felt that I would become the target by identifying myself as a reporter in the United States. And now that is a consideration for every single reporter going out on a story and that didn't exist before and so the parallel to me was just frightening and it happened very rapidly here uh, for example in 2017 um, the committee to protect journalists and another organization i forget they started something called freedom tracker where mm -hmm. they actually tracked attacks against journalists in the united states for the first time ever mm -hmm. there was not a need for a freedom tracker eight, ten years ago. And the numbers are pretty high. They've and documented nearly a thousand assaults on journalists since then in the U.S. In the U.S. Since 2017 when it was set up. 300 arrests. And they track arrests. They track barring people. They, they track um, uh, judicial harassment, uh, barring access. They, and, and, but overwhelmingly, what they rec w the overwhelming number of attacks on journalists in the United States are physical attacks. Out of 1,600 cases, 900 are physical attacks, and so, um, so, and and that just changed. And so, to to have the career that I had, and and be in a foreign country, and then watch that change so rapidly here, then it was like, this is a story about us. Yeah, and I think you know one of the great treasures of this book is that you know one of my frustrations been watching this is that average Americans don't appreciate the risks that journalists take, right? They think they're the enemy of the people. So you've documented not only, you know, Regina, but all these other reporters in there who really just want to get at the truth um, and do such brave work. Uh, and so um, maybe this could help as sort of a correct corrective of that. But I wonder um, if you could talk for a moment. Let's, let's speak. Let's find a way to talk about Regina's case without giving it away so people can read it, right? I mean, she was going after investigating some kind of government malfeasance, some officials, um, and the government pushes a fictional story of her partying one night, uh, a robbery. Talk, just give the basics of it so people have a sense of just how crazy this all was. Well, she was, a, she was a reporter for many years. She started in the 1980s. And from the very beginning, she was a different kind of reporter because when she started, um, the press was still pretty, very much controlled by the, by the central party in Mexico. And she started from the very beginning as a person who actually didn't accept the official story, went out to verify it, talk to people, interview people, look for documents. She traveled outside in those days people would sit in the office and wait for the press release to come in and they would they would print it almost verbatim and then she would go out and ask questions she would travel to far corners of the state and so she was in very ripe territory because nobody was telling these stories so she came back with these incredible stories and it was not the the custom to to publish or print at the time 
And, but she fortunately worked for a, a newer newspaper that wanted that kind of reporting. And so she had all these stories and it made her very unpopular with the powers that be for many, many years. So, um, so she was known, they called her an uncomfortable reporter and not very well liked by the establishment. And, um, but in the last years before her death, the situation in all of Mexico and particularly in the state changed where the terrain became increasingly more dangerous and everyone thought it pretty much said it was because of the narcos the drug cartels were fighting but there was a morphing in organized crime in general and also in public corruption that made the situation extremely dangerous and for her to continue on her path which was public corruption it's almost as if she and the other reporters didn't understand how dangerous it had become i think they did but it was because it was so new it was something they didn't quite know how to gauge and they were used to being harassed and chased out f their whole careers and so they kind of normalized some of the harassment that had gone on and some of the threats they'd all received threats and um, and so with this morphing of, of, of the organized crime and public corruption, she knew it was very dangerous. But I also think she couldn't stop herself from trying to, to just meet out this information to try to verify what she had and to print it, even though she knew it was really dangerous. Um, and so I think that is why that crime occurred at that moment, even though she had been reporting for more than 20 years, probably 20, 25 years or so, it was that the terrain changed and the reporters that I interviewed for the book did say, we didn't quite get it. We didn't, we didn't know what to take seriously because we had always endured it at a certain level. And um, I think that she, I, I, this is where I'm getting into a little speculation, but. I think she knew exactly how dangerous it was, but she thought, I, c I, I can get this one out. I can still get this one out. And then maybe I'll just walk away. After um, this last story yeah. that she... So you yeah. spend a long time hunting through the archives of her old pieces. She was actually let go, right, from her previous job before she went to Processo. Like, she well, was considered too dangerous for the paper. Right, right, exactly. Um, like, imagine you're an editor and you have this star reporter and she just such good work that you're too afraid to have her on staff anymore, right? It's basically what happened. Well, she, she was very, she was uncomfortable for her editors too because her editors became very close with the governor. Mm -hmm. And if you were close with the governor, you got a lot of money to run your operation. And that's how they kept you quiet. In the, in the post-authoritarian age, in order to keep, and when democracy came to Mexico, in order to keep the press silent, they would just give them a lot of money. And the and the tacit agreement was, you know, don't ruffle our feathers and you'll keep getting all this money. So the editors of her paper were very cozy with the government and getting lots of money. And so her her stories were jeopardizing that arrangement. And so they eventually, what they did was they just stopped publishing her stories because she was causing too much trouble. So she would go to work every day, report, write stories, and they wouldn't publish them. But at the time, she was also a stringer for Proceso. So Proceso would publish what she was writing, but not her local newspaper. And then finally, they just parted ways. So why did this happen this way? And I mean, there, there's some illusion in the book about, okay, so your democracy, now you have to like run for, you have to campaign, you need money to campaign. And so like, there's, there's more corruption or, but like, why, why did Mexico go this way in terms of that level of brutality towards reporting? And other young democracies don't necessarily have that as bad. What is it specifically about there? Is it the drugs and the, you know, that, you it, know. Um, it, it's rooted in the in the drug trafficking, but it's not the drug trafficking per se. So people always write it off easily mm -hmm. as well. The narcos are killing journalists, and they're really not. In some cases they are, but not in most cases they're not. And um, so what happened was that um, 
if you watch Narcos Mexico, you, uh, <laughs> you can see how the drug trade changed dramatically when it went from what used to be mostly marijuana and some low-grade heroin to, to transporting cocaine. And all of a sudden, the, the drug trade became exponentially more lucrative. And, um, and so a lot of people were getting into the game and a lot of people were fighting for territory. And then coincidentally at the same time, and this is kind of an unintended consequence of democracy in Mexico, um, it, in the old days, the president controlled everything. The president appointed all the governors of all the states and, and basically controlled everything, including the organized crime. And so the governor, or, or I'm sorry, the president would have, have cut the deal with the organized crime and say, yeah, you can do this and do this, and you know, here's your parameters, and I need my cut, or whoever the local, the federal police need their cut, or whatever. And, um, and it was all kept very quiet and, and, and very you know, uh, nonviolent for the most part. And so when democracy came to Mexico and the president lost that centralization and the power went, it, it trickled down. So, the, so now the, the governors were individually elected and all the city mayors. And, and so they had each had their own little power structures. And then you had this just overwhelming organized crime moving every not just drugs but people and and illegal petroleum and anything that they could steal avocados all kinds of things run by organized crime and and so they had to cut their own deals with these local politicians and every everyone had their own deal and that's where these politicians as you know the corrupt ones like in, in Veracruz state decided well you know why work with them? We're going to run our own racket. And they, and, and, and in some cases, the governments became the organized crime themselves, the organized crime, the, the crime organizations themselves. And for the journalists to expose any of that, that's what became so dangerous because these, these elected officials were making millions and millions of dollars. They were making money like no one had ever seen before in Mexico. And no, they just didn't want anyone exposing their empire, and and all of a sudden, if you're, if you're Regina Martinez, local reporter, but working for a national magazine, doing what you always do, all of a sudden you're touching an industry that's so incredibly lucrative and that didn't really exist before. So you're do you're you're doing the same kind of work, but you're 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 poking a whole new monster. And I think that's what the reporters, when they talk about it now, they, they, they knew what was going on, but they even, actually her killing told them exactly how dangerous it was. Because up to that point, they said, we feel like we normalized it too much because of the kind of harassment we got in the past. And that was a sign to them that no, this is, this is really serious business. And when you decide to do this, there's a character named Polo, Polo mm -hmm. in the book, who told you if you pursue this story about Regina, then you would be entering La Boca del Lobo, mm -hmm. the mouth of the wolf, the mm -hmm. name of the, the title of the book. So, and one of the questions um, that was brought to me is whether you, despite everything we said about the abide AP and all that, and international journalists have certain protection if, if you feared for your own safety as you were reporting this. Well, I had to be extremely careful and extremely low key. So I, I always say that, I wouldn't say that I was worried for my own safety per se, because I had to make a very good plan to even go in there. Mm -hmm. And I had my backup and I had people monitoring me by GPS and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I had my emergency contacts and I had people on the ground in Veracruz who I trusted, who knew I was there and, you know, were ready for me to, or ready to get a phone call from me. And um, so it wasn't, I wasn't worried about me. I really had to protect the people who were talking to me because they're, they're the real brave people in this story because it was very dangerous for them to talk. And I had to, you know, I couldn't blow their cover. And so that is what really occupied a lot of my time and a lot of my thinking and a lot of my fears is I didn't want to expose anybody for helping me with this story. 
And the fact that they were so scared and there was such a tight effort to keep them from talking also indicated the magnitude of this enterprise that was this secret enterprise that nobody wanted to get exposed because long after she died, people still will not talk about this case. One of the people that you get close to in the book is her nephew, Alonzo is his name. Mm -hmm. And um, it was interesting for me reading this as someone who teaches sourcing and how do you work with sources about what happened one of the times that you were afraid for, for Alonzo mm -hmm. and when the, what the AP decided after right. that. Right. So. So, so this was an interesting lesson for me um, because in Mexico, in the United States, we learn that you have to have distance with your sources. You're not friends with your sources. You have to keep a professional distance. You have to, um, you have, to have balance. And, um, and that's how I operated. When you go to Mexico, if you use that method, you will get absolutely nothing. <laughs> Because everything there, every professional thing there is based on personal relationships. You have to have personal relationships. And I had to figure out ways to do that without violating. And of course, the AP has the same standards in Mexico as they do anywhere. So, th so there, there's a way to do it, obviously, without crossing the line. But for example, in Mexico, I, I had sources over to din like I had dinner parties of sources which you would never do here. And it was accepted there, like the AP knew about it and they didn't, my, my the boss would pay for some of them because that's how you, that's how you got people to trust you. And so, um, so there was this whole system that was kind of foreign to me to begin with. And then once going into this story where nobody wanted to talk, I really had to be around and I had to be very familiar and I had to, people had to really trust me and um, and so, and this Rahina's nephew, who is most likely the closest person to her, and the reason I wanted to, I wanted him to be part of the project because he knew her in a realm that nobody else did. She was a very hermetic person, and she closed herself off on the weekends and didn't even see her friends. And she was spending time with him because he sort of had some family issues, and she became like his surrogate mom. And so she, she, he would come over every weekend and spend long hours with her. And I really wanted that picture of her in the book. And he was the only person who could give it to me. But in order to get it from him, um, we had to spend a whole lot of time together. <laughs> and um, and we, I had him, he would come to Mexico City and he would stay at my house because I was afraid for him to stay anywhere else. And he would stay in my guest room, which you would never in the United States have a source come to your house and stay in your guest room. And he was a kind of a kid. He was in his 20s, but he was very young for his age and, and not very established. And, um, and so um, that was the way that I got him to tell me the story because he'd be sitting at my dining room table and then all of a sudden he would just tell a story. And, um, and and not in a sense of a manipulation. He knew the whole time what I was doing and I was very careful and I was very careful with drawing my boundaries with him. Like this is about a story and he wanted to be part of the story, but he had to really trust me first. So, uh, but he was a little bit, um, he was very scared himself about what was going on. And um, at one point, um, sent me a message just saying help is that the story that you want um you said you put your phone away and then you woke up to this text at 136 like help me it kathy. just said <laughs> it said kathy help in english and yeah. he doesn't speak english mm. he just put kathy help and i had i wasn't bureau chief anymore so i didn't have to live, babysit my phone all the time and mm -hmm. so i found this message six hours later and i called him right away and he and his phone was dead and um, I just thought, you know, that it, it was just terrifying. It was terrifying um, because he was ar he already had started. He had been harassed. Some people had figured out that he was talking to me. And so I wanted him to come to Mexico City to get out of that. And he was supposed to be on his way to Mexico City, but he, he didn't come. And he his phone was dead. And so that that was completely terrifying and and 
by the grace of God or whoever, he just, he was fine. But it took me several hours. And he had sent me that text because someone had tried to break into his house. And, um, and but yeah, but he, w- he was fine. But I would say, so then when I went to my editors to say what was, what had happened, they told me, they said, you're getting way too, too close to these people and we're shutting down the story. Because I was going to do this, a, a, a version of it for the Associated Press. And they were like, nah. And I said, well, I, I said, well, I'm doing this for me for a book and I have to do this kind of reporting for the book. You know, it's fine if you don't want it for the AP. In fact, I never pitched to the AP. When I told them I wanted to write this book, they said, why don't you do something for the AP? So I said, I'm, you know, I have to, this is how I have to get the information I need to get. So um, they were like, no, nah, this, this is not okay. <laughs> Yeah, I just found that really interesting because, you know, wh- you know, you're working with people. And so there's a there's a tension there, right? That the people that you give you the information are the people that you write about and like how do you keep that separation, you know? And it's it I saw it playing out repeatedly as you were trying to do these interviews it seemed in the book. Exactly. And you yeah. want as as a journalist ethically, you want people to understand why you're doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people think that we trick people all the time and tell them we're somebody who we're not and we'd sneak around and we don't. I mean, I'm sure there are bad reporters who do that, but if, if you work for a major news organization and you did that, you would be fired. And so um, it's very difficult in a situation like that, which is very dangerous, to say to people, I want to tell this story and and here's why. And because they're they're obviously going to say why would I do that why would I put myself in danger Mm -hmm. to talk to you and I think fortunately in this particular case I did have a group of her close friends who decided they they were reporters and they wanted to get the story out but they couldn't write it Mm -hmm. and they wanted it to get out so um I was lucky, actually. I think without them, I couldn't have done the book, at least n- definitely not the way I did it. But I, they, were, they were like, yes, we want someone to write the story. And so I started with them. And then because people trusted them, that's how I found Alonso, mm-hmm. because Alonso trusted them. He knew that they were his aunt's closest friends. And so he's, he said, well, if they're talking to her, I'll, I'll go check her out. And we actually... Um, I mean, and this happens a lot in reporting. It, it's 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 an art, not a science. Mm-hmm. He decided to keep talking to me because he he liked my demeanor. He Your said, "Demeanor? What do you mean?" He he thought I was a nice person, mm-hmm. and he he just had the sense that I was sincere and I was a nice person. It's interesting. And you know that's very hit and miss when you're being a reporter <laughs> going out to talk to people, but um, uh, but it was very delicate working with him and also his family her family would will not talk about this crime to this day except for him and so his family didn't know he was talking to me until now and that caused a lot of a a lot of personal problems for him oh I can imagine we don't have enough time to go deep on that but you know one of the things you said struck me that you know, well, pe- what people think about journals or whatever, and one of the things I've been saying in talks and things I've written for John and others is that to get to save our democracy, we need to restore respect for credible fact-based journalism, right, and reporters. And that means taking the, the lessons I teach about all these things. Well, no, we don't do what you think. Like, no, like what I teach in Com 104, my classes at Stanford, and ex- exporting that to a broader audience. And it's one of these questions here. Um, from the audience, you mentioned um, that there were indeed some journalists who were paid by the cartels in Mexico. And as the U.S. public becomes more skeptical of the news media due to perceived conflicts of interest, how can journalists, media organizations, and the public rebuild trust? I just love this question. Well, that's an excellent question. And I think you can join in on this too, Janine. But one of the many reasons I wrote this book, they kept increasing and piling up is I wanted, I know we have a terrible reputation and there's only 30% of 
there was a recent Gallup poll that said 30% of people maybe trust us. Like lower than used car salesmen right, or something? Exactly. Right, exactly. And we... <laughs> like, literally, no, she wrote that in the book. And, <laughs> and, and, and we know that. We know that. And in some ways, in the past, when we were a monopoly, you know, you had to get your news from the media, which doesn't exist anymore. We were kind of arrogant about it. We were like, well, of course, because we're the bearers of bad news. We're the, pe we're the people who are rooting out all the bad stuff that we want the public to know and that the, somebody's trying to hide from us. So, of course, we're going to be, the, you know, of course, we're going to not be liked. We're not, they, there was an old saying that we're, we're, it would go, um, if you want to be liked, go into PR. Because, uh, because it was like this tough thing about you're a journalist and blah, blah, blah. And, and we kind of rode that for a long time, but now, you know, we're in competition with a zillion other sources of information. And I think that um, I wanted to show people in the book what reporters do when we do our jobs right. Mm -hmm. Because I, lot, I think a lot of people don't really understand what we do. They really don't. And, um, and in the past, we felt like we didn't need to explain it. Exactly. And so, so um, I wanted to show Rahina what she did, the kinds of stories she did and the kind of impact she had and how dedicated she was and how, how precise she wanted to be. Um, so I wanted to show that. And then I wanted to show what happened to that state in Mexico when they did successfully silence the press after her death. So I wanted to show what she did. And then I wanted to show what happens when you don't have an independent, a reputable independent press, that what happens to the society, because it's really not about the journalists. If someone's going after a journalist, it's because they want to control the society, the citizens, not us. We're like the first line of attack and we're an easy target because everybody hates us. So, and, and that happened in, in, in Mexico. There was no trust for journalists in Mexico because of the system that had existed for decades. They were, they were working, you know, they were considered the voice of the government or corrupt. And so if a journalist got hit in Mexico, it was like, so what? They probably were corrupt. And so um, as I see that narrative coming here, and we're already disliked, I think that we need to be much more pr transparent about what we do and how we do it and, and why we do it. And, and, and at the same time, I think we have to have uh, conversations. The other thing that's, you know, we all get lumped into the mainstream media, the bad media, we hate the media. And I always, when people tell me, why is the media so biased? <laughs> I say, well, what media are you talking about? Because it's very diverse, and we all get lumped into this big pot of bad guys. But if you think about it, if you kind of separate that out, you start to think about, you know, a lot of people like reading their local paper, or a lot of people learn interesting things from their local paper, and or, or maybe they do know a journalist or have a journalist in the family. And so I think that people need to think about, instead of this big, you know, lump of bad media, to think more about where you get your information and, and, and why you trust it. Like, where, what are your sources and why do you trust them? And then we need to do a better job of explaining how reported journalism is different from all the other stuff you're seeing uh, all the time, like a thousand times per minute, uh, that is that is sketchy, that is sensationalist, that is unethical, that is um, wrong. So um, that's what I think. I think yeah, I we agree need with you 100%. I mean, this whole idea of journalists never wanted to, you know, I hate this horrible phrase, but show how the sausage was made, right? It was always like now, and then you have David Farenholt for the Washington Post who won a, well, now he's at the Times, right? times now uh, he went anyway he he won a pulitzer and he's he did this thing when he was uh he was tracking trump and trump's promises about oh i'm gonna give this much money whatever and he would take a picture of his reporter's notebook and post it on twitter to show people exactly here's who i called here's what I, like the reporting process so i think more of that and what you said about you know people don't know journalists right anymore because there's fewer of us because we've right, all exactly. there's more layoffs right yeah. and so it's much easier to demonize reporters when you don't know any so I have all kinds of ideas and thoughts on this, but for another day right. uh, of how we're going to restore respect for credible fact-based news. But I think the main takeaway for me from the book is here's what can happen if you don't. Here's what can happen if you let the government say 
oh, you're just a narco reporter, or you're, you know, you're fake, you're, you're discrediting any of the accountability they're going to do, and you're, in addition to their lives being at risk. So someone asks here, what coverage is your book getting in Mexico? Well, it's not out in Spanish, you said, right? It's not out in Spanish. It's only been out for a few weeks now. And, and I'm getting to the point now where I need to ask. To <laughs> I've been doing a lot of interviews and touring up here. And I don't know what has trickled down there because it's not in Spanish. Mm-hmm. So I am just at the point where I'm going to go to my sources and just ask if there's been any reaction in Veracruz to this to this book. Um, the four friends of hers who who are central in the story I'm happy to report none of them live there anymore. And so I think that's one of the... They don't live in Mexico or they don't live in Veracruz State? They either don't live in Veracruz State or they don't live in Mexico. So you feel like they'd have some protection outside of Veracruz. Right, so they have protection in that sense. And so in that sense, I wasn't... You know, it gave me some comfort that I didn't need to check in with them and say, are you okay? Because they're not there. And that was purely coincidental. They just all chose to get out of the, you know, the cauldron. They were like, okay, we're done with this or I'm going to do something else. So um, so that's probably because I would be most worried about them. And I'm so worried there. about them. I mean, you, you uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the photographer on one of her last stories was killed. Right. In Mexico City, in an apartment with three others, right? right? I mean, yeah. this is, and this is potentially government people doing this, not narcos, right? I mean, right. that's the suggestion. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like that weight. That's another thing I don't think the public appreciates that reporters doing this kind of work for international correspondents having to worry about all these. I mean, you're seeing this through in Afghanistan right now and Ukraine. The secret behind a lot of the major international news organizations like the AP, like when I worked at Bloomberg, at the Washington Post or whatever, are the local reporters. And so we all have a responsibility to protect these people. Yes. Right. And make sure that they are. And so, you know, someone's asking, well, what can we do? And, you know, like we need to highlight these things and we need to we need to help them. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, right now in the Bay Area, right now we have at Stanford, we have here in San Francisco, we have exiled reporters who had to flee Afghanistan. We uh, the Gaza Strip. I took my students to see a wonderful exhibit here of their work. Y- Ukraine, Russia, right. right? And so it's like we have to help these people somehow. I feel like. Well, there are a lot of exiled yeah. reporters in Mexico, and they can't get U.S. visas because the U.S. is so terrible right now about um, letting Mexicans into the country. So they usually go to Mexico City, which is a huge city, and you can be more anonymous there. But what? But the effect is that you're taking the person out of their environment. They can't be reporters in Mexico City. They don't know Mexico City. They don't have sources. And so you're basically shutting down the journalism by trying to protect them. And then they get to Mexico City and they, you know, they don't want to be there. They want to be back in their home states with their families. And um, and it's the, the current system of saving these journalists also shuts down the journalism. Mm -hmm. And so there's an interesting project. I mentioned that things have changed a lot in the last 10 years. The the Mexican journalists now are much more, um, in some sense, united on this. One of the reasons why they weren't for so long is because they don't trust each other. Mm -hmm. They don't know... That paranoia. Yeah, because you could be a good journalist, but you could try to work on something with somebody who's informing on you to the government or to the drug cartels. And so there's been enough change where there's enough um, trained and prepared and dedicated reporters where the pool's getting bigger, where people are starting to collaborate. And I was just at a, um, it was a conference or workshop actually, where the journalist said, we need to help the exiled journalists. When the, we need to, if they come to Mexico City, we need to tell the media companies to hire them and give them work. Or a lot of times, because they're coming from their very small places, they're not trained. A lot of them don't have, never have formal training, and so they say, "Well, what about the universities? If the if the if the big media companies won't hire them because they're not qualified, we need to get the universities to give them the training they need to get those kind of jobs." And so. This is something I'm very excited about that just started and I and and came from the journalists themselves and from Proceso journalists at Proceso magazine um, where they where they've 
they're now working on a model to do that. What all the things they need to do to set up that system to protect the reporters who have been uh, taken out, exiled. The other thing that everyone talks about is that they want teams of reporters who will go in and finish the work that caused the reporter to flee. And that's a little bit harder to do. Teams of what? Like Mexicans who would go back and yeah, like, like not a, foreign, not international. Well, it could be international, but it could, be, but, but because it's a Mexican project, they're talking about Mexican reporters who would go in and there have been some cases like that, but mostly on investigating journalist killings. They haven't gone in to actually finish their stories. They've gone in to try to figure out because the government doesn't investigate these cases. And so, so they're saying that, um, we need somebody to come in and finish the work that we had to, we couldn't do and stay alive. And, um, and that is, that's much harder, but I think in terms of keeping journalists journalists and giving them the opportunities when they have to flee their areas to still work as journalists. And it sounds like that happened here if they... If well, that's something I'm just thinking, trying to think creatively about where I think there would be a role for places like Stanford and, and Arizona and, you know, and all these places to do the well, training to, to help figure out how to report remotely, you know, in some cases. Well, the other thing, too, and, and I think this is another solution, is we need to have more collaboration and solidarity between U.S. and Mexican reporters or reporters in whatever mm -hmm. country. Um, because I feel like we can do better stories if we're doing the both ends, you know. Yeah. And um, and also, I know in Mexico, if if anyone has a U.S. backing, it does make people it does give people pause. It is like a shield of protection. Like for example, um, there's a, a a a scholarship that the embassy gives out for Mexican journalists to do investigative reporting, and so when these reporters who have the scholarship, when they do the reporting, they make sure they mention that the, they're there because of the backing of the U.S. Embassy, and they feel like that's a protection. I also think universities, like if we could do, and, and when I was at ASU, we talked a lot about partnering um, with uh, Mexican journalism programs and or various publications, um, because again, it gives them, it, it gives them a gravitas that they, don't have on their own. The, the The bottom line is the people who are doing this, who are doing these killings, they're doing it to silence and to intimidate. And so you have to have the opposite reaction so that that's not effective anymore. You have to, when they do it, we have to find a way to make Double noise. Double down on the reporting. Yeah. Well, to, well, to make, yeah, yeah, we have to show that because of the impunity in Mexico and the weak rule of law, we c you can't count on the justice system, but you could create another system where it becomes very uncomfortable for these people to kill journalists because it doesn't work, because somebody else isn't going to go in and, and, and finish the story, or because the international community is going to make a lot of noise. Well, this is, I mean, this really gets into the whole a bigger question about human rights and our foreign policy, and I can't help but think about you know, when Jamal Khashoggi was killed and then there were, how, you know, what's, is there, is there going to be any consequences? Exactly. And that's the problem. That's the problem. That case Anything is, like, you know, that's, for anyone, that, that, you know, it's, I mean, that's almost the same case. It's like the, there's not, no one's held accountable. We need to, I think, also recognize that we as readers, as citizens need to value this kind of reporting. And unfortunately, amid cutbacks in the media, there's m far fewer international reporters on the ground right. who can give that kind of protection. The numbers are dire, right, in terms of who actually has correspondents stationed, even in Mexico, yeah. right next to us, right? Um, so I think that, you know, this all needs to be part of a collective conversation about what's important about these stories. It does relate to us. I, I agree, and I also think because of cutbacks domestically, you get a lot weaker quality of journalism. Absolutely. So we're just about out of time. So I'll just end with this last lovely little question. What is the source of your courage? <laughs> <laughs> well, I honestly don't think of it that way. I think the real courage in this book was were the people who spoke to me. And I, I would say that it's more than courage, it's just curiosity. And um, 
I I just I see these things and I just want to go out and and know what's really going on and 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 break it down some way and tell a story and I think that's really the the motivation and that would be the same I'm sure for you and for most journalists it's just it's just pure curiosity and then when you get into situations like this then you do have to be realistic and you do have to you can't be cavalier and you can't be cowboy and you have to know your environment and you have to take precautions um, and it makes it much much more complicated but if the curiosity overrides that um, then that's what you do. I mean, there are a lot of things as a journalist I wouldn't do because I look at them and I, I go, well, that's way too dangerous. And and so it it's really it really comes down to the the curiosity and the idea that you just want to you want when you tell these stories or when I tell these stories, what I really want is just people for people to have empathy. I mean, it's up to the individual what they do with the information, mm -hmm. but um, it's it's um, it's in a way to show the, the the common points, the intersections. Yeah, curiosity. That's when my first day of class, uh, we go through. What do you need to be? What are the characteristics you need to be a good journalist? And people say, Oh, I have to be a good writer. I got to be all this. And I said, There's one thing that's non-negotiable: curiosity. So, I want to thank Catherine Corcoran, author of the In the Mouth of the Wolf: A Murder, A Cover Up, and the True Cost of Silencing the Press. Just a reminder that Catherine's book is available for purchase here and at your local bookstore. If you would like to support the club's ongoing efforts in making virtual and in-person programs possible, please visit www.commonwealthclub.org. I'm Janine Zakaria. Thank you, and take care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.